What's new in Java 23 and why should you care about it? Find out from the best leaders and experts who are closely involved in creating these new Java features and the ones who will help you to use them. In today's episode of JEP Explain, we'll cover JEP 482, Flexible Constructor Bodies, which is about changes to your constructors and the flexibility that they now offer to execute statements before calling other constructors. Get ready to discover what you have been missing all these years. And to do that, we have with us today, Dr. Venkat Subramaniam. Hi, Venkat. It's a pleasure to have you present with us today. It's, it's a great pleasure. Uh, thanks for having me, Mala. It's, it's exciting time for Java. So I'm definitely thrilled to talk about mm -hmm. uh, what, what's uh, one of the features in Java 23. So delighted to be here. Thank you so much. The pleasure is all ours. Uh, to quickly introduce uh, Venkat, so he is an award-winning author, Java champion, super, super popular speaker, organizer of Dev to Next conference in Denver, and so much more. Venkat wears so many hats and pro will probably need another episode to just mention his accomplishments. So once again, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. And hi, everyone. I'm your host, Mala Gupta. So, Venkat, uh, this chat is being previewed for the second time with Java 23. And interestingly, it had a different name uh, when it was previewed for the first time with Java 22. The name was Statements Before Super. So, I want to start by asking you, what is the essence of this chat? What does it offer to us developers? You know, you'd be surprised. This goes back to, oh my gosh, 35, 40 years of a problem we've been having. And, and this is something that uh, is a hard problem to solve in general. And um, way back in time, C++ did a terrible job uh, with this situation. And Java did a terrible job in a different way. So, so this problem has been around for a very long time. And it's very interesting to see how, after all these years, uh, Java is taking a step at maybe, maybe addressing that problem. So let me explain what that problem really is. I think it's, it's a lot better to just jump in and look at the code to see what that really means. So why don't we look at the code right here? Um, I actually show this code quite a bit as an as a, uh, issue that you're, you're doomed one way and you're doomed the other way as well. Uh, that's the kind of situation we are in. So let me give you a quick example here. So let's say we have a class called base. We'll keep it really, really simple. And, and this is just one of the problems it's solving, but this problem has been around for a very long time. So let's say within the, the base class, you know, we have a constructor. As you can imagine, the, the uh, concept is related to constructors. And, and within this, I'm going to call a check function. So we want to perform some kind of a check. And it really doesn't matter what check is going to do within the base because a concern is going to be elsewhere. So, so the base is calling the check, and the check is, as you can see, it's a non-final method, which means it's polymorphic. It's a virtual method. So now I want to create a class. Let's call this as derived, which obviously in this case extends from base. But to add flavor to this, let's go ahead and say a private, let's say, string value and I've initialized, I've set a variable called value, a field called value. Now, as you can imagine, the check function simply is saying the following. The check says if the value dot, let's say in this case, I want to get the length of the value. And if the length is equal to zero for the value, maybe I want to simply throw an exception. So I'll say throw new runtime, let's say exception. And in this case, we'll say invalid, let's say, value. We'll keep it really, really simple that way, right? So the check is simply checking the value's length. If it is not, uh, you know, if it is zero, it's going to blow up. That's all the check is doing. Now, as you can imagine, here is the constructor for the derived. And I'm going to take a value as an argument. And as you would imagine, I'm going to say the value that we have at hand uh, is going to be set to the given value that we're going to assign. So looking at this code, it looks rather very simple. So if I were to go back to this code and say new derived, and I'm going to go ahead and say in this case an empty string. Now, if you look at this code, the string is empty. So what we know is the length of the string is zero. So looking at this code, you may be tempted to say, oh my gosh, if you call this function, 
it is going to throw a runtime exception, which is invalid value uh, with that particular value. But let's go ahead and just do one more thing. Let's do a try right here. And, and like I said, this is a problem that's been around for a very long time. This is nothing really new in terms of the problem, whereas the solution is actually new. So if you look at this, we are like, hey, we, if we get an exception, we're going to print it. But surprise here is that when you run this code, you got a null pointer exception. Who, who wants a null pointer exception? And, and the exception is not a runtime exception, but instead a null pointer exception. It, it's like blows your mind. It's like, what, what just happened? Well, let's step back to the problem now. Way back in time in C++, they did something really weird as, as C++ does things often. And what they did in C++ is when you are in the constructor of the base, it only calls the basis method. When you are in the constructor of the derived, if you call a polymorphic method, it would route it to the derives method. So in other words, in C++, polymorphism kicks in only after a constructor called finishes. The problem with that was in C++, when you call this particular function in the constructor, it would end up calling the check in the base, even though the object is of type derived which is an incorrect behavior. Well, Java wanted to fix it, but they actually didn't fix it. They just changed the behavior. So in Java, when it came out, they decided to go against what C++ was doing. So in Java, unlike C++, polymorphism works all the time. So the problem in this code is, when you call the constructor of derived, it first calls the constructor of base, before it calls the constructor of derived. So there is an implicit, if you will, uh, if you, in this particular case, with, without us seeing it, there's an implicit call to super. So in other words, if you don't write it, it is there even if you don't write it. So as a result, this makes it a bit more visible to us. When you run the code, you're saying new derived, it comes in here, but first goes to the super, which goes up here, calls the check because of polymorphism it comes down to the check in the derived but the value has not been initialized yet because that happens after the call to the supers constructor so as a result value is null and you're calling length on null that's why we get a null pointer exception so c++ took one direction java took the completely different direction the opposite direction and both are doomed because if you don't call the derived method, you got a split behavior of calling a base method on an object of derived, you're breaking polymorphism. If you go the Java route, you're using polymorphism, but that's a bit premature because you are coming into the derived before the constructor had a chance to finish. This is actually even more treacherous because you may be breaking invariant because remember one rule we follow, you don't mess with an object until a constructor finishes. Well, guess what? The highlighted code has not run yet, but yet the check method on the derived is being called before the constructor is completed. So both options are doomed, and that has been the state of that problem for a good 40 years now. So that's where we are in, in terms of the problem we want to solve. Right. So. Um... How are we solving this problem now? Yep. So, so, so that's the, the problem comes in, the fact that we ended up calling the constructor of the base and then coming back to initialize this particular variable. Well, I'm going to kind of show you a little bit here by tweaking this back to Java 22 just for a second. So I've, I've set it to Java 22 right now. If I go to this code and if I call super right there, after this construct, right? So one way we could solve the problem is to say, hey, I understand the base constructor need to be called, but I, let me get an opportunity to initialize my field before calling the base constructor. Well, guess what? If I try to run that, it fails, and the error is telling me cannot reference the value of the super uh, type uh, constructor has until it's been called. Well, that's because 
that's not permitted in Java in uh, the traditional way. So Java's restriction was the very first thing you have to do is the constructor call, whether you pass arguments or not, and then you can do anything else you want. Well, that restriction has been now removed in Java. So I'm switching over to Java 23 on my side right now, and I'm gonna go ahead and run this code right here, and notice the runtime exception invalid value comes in up here. Well, that's because, why is that? Well, I wanna say the value that I wanna set here is the value, and as you know, that value is an empty string. That's why we got a runtime exception, not a null pointer exception. On the other hand, if I went here and said, okay, you can see there's no more exception and the code just finishes up. And I'll simply say in this case, output okay, just to see that in there on the screen. So the idea here is they relax the restriction and the restriction being relaxed here simply says, well, you can uh, you know, uh, modify a field of a class before you call the supers constructor, whether you have our parameter to send or not. Again, this is just one feature of this, uh, one, one particular capability of this feature, but it solves a very fundamental problem. To answer your question, the way this problem is solved now is for you to say, oh, wait a minute, my base constructor is most likely going to do some extra work. Uh, maybe the base is acting as a factory method where the constructor is gonna call some methods on the derived, let me get ready for it. So let me initialize the states I would need before I hand over the control to the base so that the base, if it were to call my method, those methods are uh, ready with the values that's been initialized. So, so that they relax that restriction in order to support this particular capability. That, that makes a lot of sense. And um, there was uh, mention of the other use cases that we could use uh, this feature in. Uh, one of uh, very common things that developers use is when we have to uh, pass a value to the base class constructor, we need to verify the values. But until now, we used worked around because call to the super or the base class, the same class constructor had to be the first statement. So the workaround was to create static methods and then call that method while passing the arguments. So I think we could relax that one as well. Uh, it actually, you're, you're absolutely right, but that mm -hmm. problem itself is a little bit more deeper as well. So you can think mm -hmm. about the problem as a two-pronged problem, if you will. So to understand that problem, let's say for a minute, uh, where it might or might not work depending on the situation. So for example, I switch back to 22 again to illustrate this. So in here, I'm calling a super, but I don't have any parameters to send. However, I really want to fail fast. So to fail fast, I want to be able to say if value dot length is equal to zero, and I want to check for that particular value right there. And of course, maybe I want to throw the exception uh, in here as well. Well, in this particular case, you could put this into a function clearly, right? Where the function can check the value and blow up. So for that purpose, the check could be a static method as well as an example. Then in this case, you can send the value as an argument. So theoretically speaking, to the point you made, we could have done something like a check right here and we could have said the value a value being given to us. But the problem is that the super doesn't need any arguments. So as a result, this code would not be able to compile. So this is a two-pronged problem. You may have to do some work before you pass the data to the base or just do some work without you know, regard to uh, passing the data to the base. And the problem in this case is we wanna call the super, but we wanna perform the check and fail fast before the super is called. Once again, in this particular case, you know, how do I make that happen? Well, Java 21 permits that, but just to emphasize it, let me just switch over here to make this even more uh, you know, emph emphatic. I'm gonna run the code and, and you're gonna see that this is not gonna be you know, much, much in favor for me because this is gonna be an older version of Java and that right there. Uh, I just switched over to Java 17 to illustrate this. And it says call to super must be first statement in the constructor. Well, tough luck, you cannot even fail fast 
by calling a static method. So the solution to your point would have been, hypothetically speaking, let's say the base is receiving some kind of a data, right, which is not using. And imagine, again, this is a complete hack at this point. I have a value that I'm going to return here. So in this case, again, sticking with the older version of Java, this would have worked. But unfortunately, that is not an elegant solution most of the time when the constructor doesn't need any particular data. So the question is, without resorting to such hacks, how can we really make something like this possible? And as you can see, that's not permitted. But switching over to either you know, Java 22 or Java 23, that restriction goes away and you're able to call a static method which can perform a check. On the same line as, as a corollary, if you will, rather than failing fast, this could be performing a computation. When it performs a computation, you can set the you know, result into that variable and you could pass the result to that particular call in the event that you need to do some extra work and you're not forcing yourselves to put all of that into that one place. This can even become, become a bit messy because what if the base we're taking two parameters, let's say for a minute. So we have, let's say operation one and an operand two. So I got two parameters I wanna send, but I wanna compute the values from the A value. Well, tough luck because I have to do everything in that limited space. So I might say a value, let's say times two, uh, for instance, and a value, maybe I wanna even keep it the same times two. But I, how sad I had to repeat that two times in there. But instead what you can do now is you really have the luxury of saying, I have an A and B where the value uh, you know, A is equal to a value times two, but I can just pass the value A again if I wanted to. So both the values can be the same, being passed in as a value times two in here, as a temporary variable that you can pass up there, or you can set that to a variable B, and you can pass that a variable B, or this could be something else as well. It starts giving you that flexibility by removing that artificial constraint. So, so what the newer version of Java is doing is to, to back and ask the question, we want to be restrictive, but what makes sense to be actually restrictive? You don't want to just simply say, stop, you cannot do anything, but instead ask the question, are there levels to what you should be allowed to do? And there are things you shouldn't be. And so it's distilling that down uh, to that particular level to give us more flexibility and restricting only where it actually makes sense. That, that um, example makes so much sense. I remember when I was talking about this feature with a developer, so that was 22 release of 22 when we had the first, uh, it was in first review. And the developers was like, why, why do we even need this feature? Because what I was able to do pre, uh, prior to this feature was separation of concerns. So I could define the functionality that I wanted in, in a method and just call it on my uh, value while passing uh, while calling the constructors, why do I need to define the code within the method? And my argument was you have the freedom to decide where you want to do that. And it also follows a very natural flow of how you would think and write. You don't have to think about the other workarounds because if we look at a bigger code base, if we have many workarounds, then the code becomes kind of difficult to understand if you're talking about workarounds all the time. So it's, it's the freedom of choice that Java has now. And, and you, you're absolutely right. And, and add to that a little bit about some of the things we still cannot do in Java. We yes. cannot return multiple values from a function so easily. Yes. And, and, mm -hmm. and also, you don't have the ability to do the spread operation in Java yet. If you had the ability to send multiple values back from a function, if you had the spread operator, you could argue that you can go right here and call the function that, that's going to spread and whatever function you want to call. I'm just using an arbitrary notation here to spread the result of it. And you can send a value here. And, and that would spread into the two values that a super will ask for. But, but the fact is, 
unlike a lot of languages that provide that kind of feature, Java doesn't have those features. So, so it's, it's not only constrained by the fact that we have this limitation, it's also constrained by a few other things we cannot do in Java. Whether those things are needed or not is a completely separate discussion. And, and to, the, to the point that your developers are saying, they are right in the fact that they may have run into situation that often conforms to the constraint, which is great. You, know, you call yourselves lucky. I, I'm, I'm, I'm cool because I have never had to cross that limit. But if you're writing more complex code, which requires uh, you know, substantial effort to set up, and that itself is going to be multi-lines long, and you may have to call other few functions, sure, you can wrap them all into another function and call it, but why are you doing it? Not because that's a better design, it's because I'm forced to. And, and that's where I think this makes a difference is, it gives you that flexibility as a, a, for a developer and you can stay with the simple situation if that still works for you. But if the simple situation doesn't work for you and you need to breach that constraint, now they allow you to breach that constraint in a legitimate way. So it gives the power to us, the programmer. You're not forced to use this structure, but you're not limited to not using it as well. And that is the beauty of removing restrictions is it then puts the burden on us, the programmer, to choose the design that's suitable for the problem we have at hand and not simply throw our hands up and say, I really wish I could do this, but the language doesn't allow me to do that. That's the best part of, of this scenario, I think. Uh, Venkit, why do you think uh, Java had this restriction in the first place? Because it was there since Java 1.0. Uh, why were developers not allowed to have statements before call to super or this in the constructors? You bet, you bet. Definitely. The, the, so by removing the restriction, keep in mind they didn't remove all restrictions. And that means it's a lot more effort to implement this code at the compiler level to determine what is possible, what should be permitted, and what shouldn't be permitted. But, but why is there a restriction in the first place? And the reason is there is a logical order in which an object should be constructed. So when you have an object-oriented hierarchy, the base must be constructed before the derived is constructed. So you do want to go back and forth between uh, the, the hierarchy on one hand and what instance you, are, instance you are creating. So if I'm creating an instance of a derived, uh, you want the base to be completed first and the derived to kick in and be constructed. This is great as long as you keep the constructors extremely simple. The constructors don't make any calls to polymorphic methods. So one of the recommendations I make always, both for C++ and Java, before Java 22, is do not call polymorphic methods from within constructor. This is why effective Java recommendation is, write a constructor as a private method, or protected method and write a static method that turns around and calls the constructors. That way, in the static factory method, you can call the polymorphic methods on the object, but by the time the base constructor and the derived constructors have completed. So you don't have the risk of calling the wrong function and breaking invariance before you uh, finish the construction process. So these were all, done with good intention. You want, it, you want a clean cut. You want to say, I finished the construction of the base, I finished the construction of the derived, now call the methods to perform the actions, polymorphism kicks in, there's no ambiguity, so it's a very clear cut design. So the restriction actually works in favor of that clear cut design. But as programmers, we don't always want to follow that purity. We are saying, yeah, but that's great, but I'm in the constructor, but I want to do something like a factory method. I want to be able to call the derived method polymorphically and take some actions while I'm in the construction. This is where we want to have the ease, but we want the flexibility as well. Well, the constraints don't allow for that flexibility, so that's why it's time to re-examine it, and I'm glad they are doing that right now. 
that that makes sense. The constraints are there to help the developers and not really constrain them. Uh, so you, you mentioned about relaxing of the constraints, but you also mentioned not all constraints have been lifted. So what is it that the developers can do now and what is it that they can't? Yeah, so let's talk about that real quick in here, just to emphasize that. I'll, I'll fall back on the on the simple code we had a minute ago. So, so let's get rid of the super for a second. And as you can see in this particular example, uh, we are getting, uh, so we are uh, going to pass a empty, as you can see right there into this. And, and of course, in this particular case, uh, we are calling the value uh, and let me make sure this is actually working. So this is supposed to give us the null pointer exception, isn't it? So, so basically in this case, uh, we, we are have the super right here coming in and, and the super is gonna be called first and, and then the check is gonna be called and the check should come into the, ah, I know what I did. Uh, so uh, as you can see, that's a null pointer exception that should be caused because the check is going to fail at this point uh, to say that it doesn't know what to do with the value it's not present. So, so that's a good restriction that's been removed, we saw, so that's great. So we can do a super. Now the problem really is, uh, this is not a, a, a free call where you can do anything you want to do. There, there's gotta be constraint on what we can do. So what you can do is you can initialize uh, fields uh, in here. So that's perfectly fine, you can do that. You can also uh, you know, create, uh, you could say local variables. That's perfectly fine as well. You, if you wanted to, just to run this example with the runtime exception, I'm gonna say int a equal to a value times four. I wanna just initialize this value to some variable a I want to create, and then I want to be able to set the value maybe to the value a. So you should be able to initialize fields and bring in uh, the local variables as well. Uh, let me make sure I have the right version here. That should have been possible, but anyway, you can create some temporary variables and work with them too. However, there is a constraint we need to really uh, value here as well. And that is, what if you're calling you know, static methods, right? So we can call static methods as well. But what about instance methods? Well, if you're gonna call instance methods from within this, so let's say, for example, I have a, a little function called run, uh, and I'm gonna simply call the run function. So I call the run function right there in the code. The compiler is not giving any errors right now. But I take the run function method, and I move it all the way to the top right there. It's not a static method. And notice I'm not allowed to call the instance method. So the reason, of course, in this case is the minute you call the instance method, now you're back to square one. You need to have set the variables before you call the instance methods. So which means you need to put this here, assuming it were allowed, and not over here. Now, unfortunately, the compiler is not gonna verify that for you entirely. It's got to make sure all the variables are initialized and you call the instance methods, it becomes a little messy. Now we are breaking the rules to say, well, there's a sequence in which you can call before the super and the net result is, this is one of the things I really appreciate in Java. They're not interested in just adding features. Uh, they are asking the question, what is the behavior and the feeling it provides to a Java developer. As a Java developer, are you able to learn a few concepts and consistently apply them? Or do you have to walk through a maze of uh, you know, decision making? I can do A and B, but not B and A, and I can do C and but not D. And by the time you split your hair, you have complicated the code a lot more. And a developer comes in and makes a slight change to the code and everything falls apart, that's not going to be a good programming experience. So while you are relaxing the rules, you don't want to remove all the guardrails around because that becomes chaotic. So, so they have restrictions in place to the extent where the code doesn't become hard to understand and hard to maintain, but then removing restrictions that otherwise uh, make it harder for us to design our code. So you cannot call instance methods before the call to the super, you have to really wait, which really discerns this to a proper behavior. You come into the constructor, 
focus on your purpose, you want to initialize your fields, that should be your primary job. Well, not only initialize your, initialize your fields, make sure your base methods are initialized as well. Uh, base uh, fields are initialized as well. Why? Because when you call a polymorphic method, a polymorphic method, sorry, when you call a method, polymorphic or not, what is it going to do? It could potentially do a super dot run if run was a method on the base class, or it can access the fields of a base. Well, if it's going to access the fields of a base or call the base method, and if you have not really called the base constructor, we're doomed. So, so the problem still exists. The reason why you want base to finish before the derived is constructed is because from the derived methods, you can use the base methods and the base fields with proper access restriction. So the invariants are still necessary for this to work properly. So just because you initialize your, initialize your fields doesn't mean you have a free for doing anything you want because the result will be an absolute chaos. You don't want that. And, and so that's the reason why they have a, a reasonable restriction in, in the, in the uh, things you can do before the constructor and things you can do after. Makes sense. Rules. Rules are rules and there are still rules. <laughs> So uh, if you talk about records, uh, records already have constraint call to the constructor. So how does that work with this feature? Easy. Record, <laughs> records, records cannot extend from classes. Yes. Records cannot extend from uh, uh, even a record because that's implicit. So, yes. so this constraint doesn't appear as much to records because the call to super is just basically called to record, which is just an object. There's not a whole lot you need to do. So I don't think we need to be uh, constrained about it. I would say this is one of the features that solves a very age old problem, but it's a bit of an isolated solution in Java. Uh, we've seen a lot of features that not only solves a problem, but gives you a bonus by you know, helping you with other features as well. They, they interplay nicely with other features. Um, this one uh, just plays well to solve a very old problem. There is not a whole lot of, a lot of interplaying here. But the, one of the reasons for that is th this whole thing is really an implementation detail. It, it really is encapsulated within that constructor. That's where we are. So, so the, the whole focus is, what can I do within a constructor with reference to interacting with my base or calling other constructors, right? You could have said this in parentheses, so that applies to this as well. So it's an interplay between your constructor and that of the base or your constructor and that of another constructor in your own class and in what sequence you can implement the code within the body of a constructor. So, so the interplay of this with other features is fairly limited to the construction feature, not a whole lot getting into the, uh, the uh, uh, you know, other features, if you will. So you already answered my next question because this is what I was planning to ask you. How how does it plays with with the other features? Because we know when we talk about pattern matching, so there the switch constructs of uh, sealed classes and records they they play really well together, and uh, they deliver together they deliver much more than the individual features. Uh, so my next question is, how does this work behind the scenes? So is Java changing the JVM instructions or not? So the JVM instructions don't have to change. However, mm -hmm. it does modify the sequence in which the methods are being executed. Uh, so, but that's one of the powers of the JVM already, isn't it? JVM has the ability to reorder instructions as long as the integrity of the object can be preserved. So this is not adding any Byte, new bytecode to, uh, uh, to the JVM, but it does have an impact on the code that is being generated. The, the sequence of operations, as we saw earlier, you, if when you're running through a proper sequence, the fields are not initialized until you get to the point where you're initializing it. 
So, so that does modify that particular uh, idea. In, in language like C++, again, going back to C++, because, because the origin of Java was influenced by C++. Um, in language C++, you can see the spillover into C, in C Sharp as well. You typically, what you do, this is not a Java syntax, but uh, a C++ syntax is to say, you know, uh, uh, derived, and then you would have said something along the lines of, you could have said base, and you would send the data to the base. So this, this gives you an opportunity to clearly pass data to the base even before you come into the derived. But along the same note in C++, you would have also said value and you'd have said a value. So even before you get into the body of a constructor, and again, I want to emphasize, this is not Java, right? For anyone who's just looking at the screen, uh, this is not Java, but this is the way C++ and a few other languages behave, is where you can say, I want to initialize my field with a value before I even step into the body of a constructor. So, so there are these. These have been attempted before uh, to to entertain this idea of uh, you know forcing fields to be initialized before we do any real work in the body of the constructor. Java obviously doesn't have that syntax, uh, but but as a result, uh, there are these features being provided to to say, hey, let's focus on the field initialization, and then next to do any operations in a way to use the word you used earlier is a nice separation of concern so you're saying mm -hmm. let's focus on you know one concern now and then now that we are done with it let's focus on the next concern so it, it does bring a bit more clarity to the code by by making that possible as well so 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 that that changes the instructions at the bytecode level but it's not going to need any specific instructions for it you are not doing anything different you're only doing things differently, right? So, so, but in the case of pattern matching and uh, sealed and record, you are doing something different. But here you're only doing things differently, not anything different than what you did. You initialize objects before, well, at the end of the day, you're initializing objects again. So, so you're not doing something totally new, you're just doing it differently. Oh, thank you, you said that very well, that, that we are doing things uh, differently. Uh, we're doing different things, but not differently. So that kind of, it, it's beautiful because the constraints have been relaxed. The developers are able to do new things, but still it doesn't affect the JVM instructions. I think that that is beautiful to give them more freedom, but still preserving the constraints that the JVM has. So I, I think that's commendable, speaking of Java. And then th that's also uh, is, is, a, is a kudos to two things, right? The, the power of the JVM, the instructions, and the amazing capability of the developers behind the Java language who are able to push these boundaries so much uh, while maintaining the constraints uh, of the language developed over. I mean, I mean, think about this for a minute, right? It just gives me goosebumps even to think about it. We work on a code base which is four years old and we complain about legacy code. This is, 28 coming up to 30 years of legacy right so you can imagine a 30 year old legacy code and these people absolutely brilliant in my opinion right they're like hold my drink and i'm gonna go in and change this in a cohesive way and and they are just paddling through the biggest legacy system humans have known i would say if not the biggest one of the biggest, if you will. Uh, and, and that to me is just amazing, both from the power of the JVM, but also the, the brilliance of the developers behind the language itself. Uh, I've got the deepest respect for both. Absolutely true that, absolutely. I, I was talking with Brian for the last interview and uh, it, it's amazing how uh, he talks about the new features and how the changes that they plan. So yes, every, yes to everything that you just said. So um, on that note, I think we've covered the JEP, uh, almost all the points that you want to do. So now we have a couple of fun sections for you. So starting with the first one, which is uh, myth or fact. So I'll uh, say one or two statements, and then you have to tell me whether it's a myth or a fact. So of course, if it's a myth, you'll have to correct it. So the first one is, um, uh, developers usually, uh, usually mention that they don't like working with trivial language features because they are not permanent. 
Um, I would say myth. And the reason I would say myth is the word developer is too broad. We got 10 million people using Java. We cannot classify all of them into a single uh, you know, group, if you will. For example, uh, not all features are really useful for everybody all the time, but when somebody is keenly interested in a feature, they jump in and start exploring it in the preview uh, time as well. And the benefit of that is they can see if this is gonna solve their problem. They're able to provide feedback. We know of several feedback that's come through by developers applying it and saying, this is working or this is not working or how it should be improved. So those are enormously useful. So I'm gonna call a myth on that for that reason. Makes sense. And any developer who is watching this, please uh, give your feedback to the Java development team. They love to hear from you, the, the actual experience of you having of uh, used that feature. So the next statement is instance main method is one of your favorite features from Java 23. I would say not. Uh, my favorite feature is there are a few things that are actually quite exciting. Um, I would say you could argue they are not directly in 23. Maybe they are going through preview evolution, but I would say there are maybe two, if not three things that I'm truly excited about. And, and one of them for me is the gatherers. Uh, the gatherers are very amazing in terms of the capability. Um, I'm, I'm, uh, if, if I can do a shameless plug, I've been writing a book on uh, cruising along with Java. It's still in a, a development, uh, but I fell in love with the gatherers that Victor Klang and the team have been developing. And I have to admit, that's been one of the most challenging chapter to write in the book. Uh, in fact, just last week, I split that into two chapters because it's so good, but it's got so much complexity into it. So my favorite feature is the evolution of gatherers, uh, which was introduced as a you know preview feature in 22, but it's a second preview in 23. So that to me is exciting. I'm also really excited about seeing the evolution of the structured concurrency that is maturing and moving forward. I'm excited about that as well. And, and to your point about the previous question, uh, I've used it for a while now, even before it was a preview feature. And every time I upgrade Java, I can see the codes change uh, you know, ever so little, but there are changes in there uh, to see that they are using the feedback loops to improve and change the code as well. So that is certainly an interesting feature for me. So, so yeah, uh, you know, as being introduced in 23, you could say that's a very important feature of being able to call the you know, variables and uh, initialize the variables, uh, instance, instance field initialization. But I would say there are other really exciting features uh, in, in all uh, uh, practical purpose with a greater impact on, on the developers. Uh, you know, don't get me wrong. The constructor feature is useful. It's exciting. Uh, but the impact, uh, I think, is in other places a lot more than that as well. Certainly a useful feature, but I got more exciting things to, uh, to pick as well. I, I would have called you for the other Jeff if I had known this earlier. <laughs> Okay, so um, now moving on to the next section, which is another fun section. So now I will show on your screen uh, a tongue twister, and you have to try and say that. So if you if you excel at that one, I have another one for you. <laughs> so, so it so says, can you read it out? Okay. So, yes, you're, you're... Okay, so before Super Java's jumbled statements, a flexible constructor flexes fantastically fascinating frenzied phrases past this puzzle. I, 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 my stomach is hurting already. <laughs> that, that was good, but you're not so, supposed to go so slow. You, you have to make it a little faster. And okay. on that note, I will show you another one. <laughs> uh, so this is a tongue twister, so I'm supposed to read it really fast. I, I, I'm getting it. I'm a slow learner. <laughs> So super slight constructor in Java jungle, uh, just flexible fixes. Fa I don't even know what this means anymore. Th th this is giving me jitters. Uh <laughs> that, that's how they're supposed to be. <laughs> uh, 
okay, so I don't even understand. You know what? My parser is not capable to parse that. <laughs> Okay, point, point taken. <laughs> so, so let's move on to the next section that we have. So this is about, um, so now this, this I, I would say this is the most fun section. So I would display on your screen again a set of statements, and then you have to react to, the, uh, to those statements uh, as in an emoji, but you cannot type in that emoji. So you have to enact that using your gestures, your hands, faces. So ready? So this is the first one. Yay! <laughs> so that, that is a good one. So this is the next statement. Hiking is boring. <laughs> We're done. Frank, Frank, Frank is already away for hiking. <laughs> next time we will hike together and then we will revisit the topic. <laughs> yes, yes, we will do that very soon. So Def to Next conference is just a few weeks away. Absolutely. I'm oh. delighted. Uh, it's been a fun experience uh, putting this conference together with all the amazing speakers and the lineup of talks. I, I, I just I'm, I'm absolutely humbled and thankful for all the things that's coming together. So, yeah, thank you. I, I was hoping for another uh... <laughs> <laughs> reaction like oh my god I, I'm, I, jumping, I have jumping to say <laughs> I have to say it's not as exciting as Java 23 coming out honestly uh, <laughs> because that has a wider impact on the world I think uh, but but I'm very humbled and uh, uh, you know uh, thankful for uh, all the help I've received in putting this conference together I truly want this to be a community event and and uh, a lot of people jumped on that uh, idea can clearly see why that should be useful and, and the support I've gotten is absolutely amazing. So I'm truly looking forward to that in a few weeks. Many congratulations to you for that. And um, yes, that, that has been, I've, I've seen a lot of conference, uh, the sessions and they look amazing. So this one is the last one. Java community is one of the best. Yes, again, a yes. thumbs up for yes. that, two thumbs up for that, yes. and more thumbs up, all yes. fingers yes. out. <laughs> uh, that, that's the best part of Java, in my opinion. Don't get me wrong, Java as a language is fantastic, but Java as a community is what really makes that special, in my opinion. Uh, it, it's, you know, I, I once said that the Java is a passport to the world. And, I, I, and, and every time I'm reminded by that, I, I cannot tell you how I would be in a random part of the world and, and somebody, you know, in the airport, in a restaurant, in a bus, in a train, in random places uh, would, you know, either look at a shirt I'm wearing or find a connection to Java. And then the next several minutes or several hours, depending on where we are, we end up talking about, you know, programming and Java. So, so definitely it's the community that, that's awesome. Uh, I, I don't think uh, Java is great, but I think Java is great partly because of a fantastic community that's behind it. Uh, you know, engineering definitely made it happen. It's a community that's giving it the life to continue. That's the way I see it. Be beautifully said. Thank you so much, Venkat. It, it was fun to talk with you, pleasure to talk with you and learn from you as usual, as always. Thank you so much for being here and for sharing your opinions and the slides, code, everything, for talking uh, with us about this new job. And I'm, I really hope everyone who's listening uh, to, who would listen to this uh, interview would learn more about the new Java features which are coming in Java 23. So once again, thank you so much. Always a pleasure to learn from you. Thank you, Mala. Thank you and all the best. Thank you.